everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, today is the day that you have long been waited for because you watched Whoosh Star Crash. Me, Mike Vanderpool, Michael Klink, and Dr. Alan Barris, a.k.a. Dr. Love. Gonna talk some movie time. We talk real Hollywood movie, Clink. <laughs> Yay! Alan, how are you? Are you you traveled this week? Uh yes, and I'm doing fine. <laughs> it's not like I'm not used to it. It wasn't the, no. The, so like we don't have a premise uh, for a road trip movie that came out of your trip back to West Virginia. <laughs> nope, I was not. Uh, I did not encounter any terrifying roving hicks. I did not uh, encounter a wait, wait, wait. Uh, so a lovable yet corrupt and probably racist sheriff. <laughs> I none of that happened. We so. really maybe next season should be road trip movies. Barris sounds more irritated today than usual well yeah because he's been it's fourth fourth week of the semester we all i've been sitting around <laughs> waiting for this clown show to get started whoa 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 <laughs> clown show would actually mean we prepared alan <laughs> today we are going to talk about a 1987 film called dragnet which i argue is one of the best movies ever i'll say it i'll throw it down uh starring uh christopher Plummer, and we are doing Dragnet. Uh, last week we talked about doing uh, the Apple, but uh, Christopher Plummer uh, passed. Take it away, Alan. So let us virtually pour one out for our old white homie, Christopher Plummer. <laughs> All right. So this is a chunk of an AV club interview with Christopher Plummer that uh, ended up getting excerpted in uh, the IMDb quotes page because it's one of the best interviews ever. They asked him about a bunch of roles that he did. And it's just great. So here's what he had to say about our reason for being here. Star Crash. Star Crash. Oh, my God. There are two things I can say about that. One, give me Rome any day. I'll do porno in Rome as long as I can get to Rome. <laughs> Getting to Rome was the greatest thing that happened in that for me. I think it was the only, th it was only about three days in Rome on that one. It was all shot at once. And the girl, what's her name? Monroe? Caroline Monroe. Caroline Monroe. She was something incredible to look at. That was a great pleasure, too. But beyond these two things, I mean, how could you play the Emperor of the Universe? What a wonderful part to play. It puts God in a very dicey moment, doesn't it? He's very insecure, God, when the emperor is around. <laughs> and now God's going to be even more insecure because he's got Christopher Plummer yes. to deal with directly. <laughs> Christopher Plummer, uh, emperor in Star Crash, and Star Crash being the reason that we are here. Mm -hmm. Um. Plumber, I looked at his IMDb page. Holy mackerel! Lots of things I don't even know what they are. Oh yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's of the British uh, acting uh, generation, and I put Michael Caine in this. I put Bob Hoskins in this to a certain extent. Where if you um, throw money at them, they'll be in anything. Uh, uh, Christopher I mean, Lee, right? Uh, uh, Christopher up until Lee, the Hobbit yeah, stuff, right? Lord of the Rings stuff. Although he was older. Yeah. Um, there were, I mean, just anybody in that generation. Charles Dance. They love to work. Um, that was it, right? That they love yeah. to work. That was. I and they love argue, money. They probably love to get paid. Yeah, they yeah. probably love to get oh, yeah. paid more. So. And they really <laughs> don't care when it comes right down to it. They have a good time, but they do not take themselves overly seriously. Yeah. So Almost Michael like, Caine um, can go act against the world's worst shark, and everything <laughs> works out. Almost like um, Ooh, who, dirty rotten scoundrels. Wasn't I mean. it recently? Uh, what Jude was Law was was in everything, and then what Cuba Gooding Jr. was in a lot of stuff. No, oh, um, uh, Don Cheadle was in a lot of stuff too. It's like almost like they're they don't say no to things because you're in everything, you get paid. Plus, then you have this range of I can do bad things, I can do Oscar award winning things, and well, everything and in think, between. I think too for uh, this is from the room, right? Or the, at least. Uh, not the room, uh, the, the disaster artist, when okay. they were talking about the lady that played the, the mom, the, mm -hmm. the mother with cancer, she just uh, loved to act. Like, that, they didn't care. They really don't care. Like, they're, that's their craft. Like, if I wasn't teaching, I would be standing on the corner giving my lectures to... <laughs> <laughs> to pigeons? <laughs> that's not what I thought you were going to say about standing on the corner. 
Anyways. <sighs> so, uh, Dragnet is a 1997 film what? written... 87. 87, sorry. Um, directed by Tom Mankiewicz. I believe he was also uh, part of the writing team, Dan Aykroyd being on the writing team. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tom Mankiewicz, Hollywood kind of royalty. I believe his dad was a writer on uh, Citizen Kane. Um, so a lot of experience. And again, I will set it before I'll say it again. I believe this is a perfect movie. Everything is perfect from the script to the acting, to the casting, to the wardrobe, the sets. I mean, there is nothing here that goes wasted. So a perfect movie then is something that is, uh, just encapsulated. There's no stray threads of plot, no plot holes, no, why do they do that or anything like that? Yeah, there is one WTF moment. There's one WTF moment that I found. Everything the else is perfect. The song at the end and the credits? No, that doesn't count. What but song like, was so, it? So like if we had to take Supergirl on the one side <laughs> of, an, of the complete travesty of a movie and a complete waste of everything, this is the anti-Supergirl of movies. Which is crazy because it gets a, a terrible reviews in like uh, IMDb. It's got like a six out of ten rating. Metacritic is like fifty percent. Like that's people, because not everybody who saw this saw it from the lens of a thirteen-year-old boy. That is which true. Is that is important for us to remember. I still maintain Clue is one of the best movies ever, and I saw it in the same time period. Yeah. That is good because they have the multiple endings. I like that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the original Dragnet started out as a radio play. Um, and it was a procedural cop show like you do. And then it went on to TV again, procedural cop show like you do where it's, uh, victims and it was like life lessons and uh, crinkly paper and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, but the, the whole thing is this was re not real. It was supposed to be realistic and it was supposed to be serious, yep. but then you have Dan Aykroyd and Tom Hanks playing opposite each other in this movie and it was very much not serious even dan Aykroyd, who plays the straight lace guy is supposed to be comedic supposed to be funny mm -hmm. i i just i like the movie don't get me wrong but i didn't understand the switch in tone from the original to this and even i, I read in the the trivia that uh dan Aykroyd loved uh the original show so why not make it a, an actual crime drama movie instead of a comedy well, number one, then you'd cast someone other than Dan Aykroyd in it, uh, well, and maybe. probably someone other than 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 eighties era Tom Hanks. Yeah, too. definitely. Yeah. Uh, but on top of that, this is a movie that, uh, much like Austin Powers, the, a lot of the humor comes from taking something that is obviously dated, and then moving it to well, in this case, the eighties, but moving it to the modern. Uh, period. So it's uh, to a certain extent, it's uh, the latest incarnation of Joe Friday, uh, his nephew, mm -hmm. uh, who then gets transplanted into our crazy modern age and has to learn the importance of having feelings. It is that fish out of water type yeah. story, right? Yeah. It's it's similar to what they did with the Brady Bunch remake, where they just brought him into the modern age, where everything else stayed the same. Yeah. I mean, there is, and again, Alan, I was I was thinking Austin Powers as well. Yeah, but and I, I don't know. Streetback is like the and like the like if you were capable of making like the mid '80s into a human being, it would be Pep Streetback. It would be <laughs> yeah. Tom yeah. Hanks's character in this. With Austin Powers, it was more of a spoof and an homage to all of a genre of films. And yeah. with this, it's more of a let's take this, like you said, transplant one character, one aspect mm -hmm. of this into a modern day and see what happens. So yeah, it, it just pretty. seems it seems different because you could you could you could even have um uh, a James Bond or a, a in like Flint type movie nowadays and it doesn't necessarily have to be a comedy it could be serious you just would have some problematic issues with some of the the plot points <laughs> well and then we get into the issue of well how much lampshading and other indications would we need to wink at the audience to let us know that things have changed because mm -hmm. if you just did a straight bond film these days uh you just audience would just look at you like you were crazy well and that's uh, why they've made them they wouldn't get it that's why they've made them more serialized where it's right. one film feeds into another and it's more kind of action-packed and stunts and well they're exploring more of uh i think I, I think this was in the bulletproof uh screenplay podcast where they talked to john truby about 
specifically about superhero films, but even uh, James Bond being in something of a superhero, um, or at least the, the beginning of that genre maybe in film, where early on um, we did nothing to really build his character and understand his character. And it was Casino Royale where they kind of started exploring why he was like he was that made him a much more interesting character for modern audiences. And that seems like it, uh, it's the same type of thinking is with the dark Knight series too, where they yeah. are trying to give Bruce Wayne, not this. Uh, Hold on. Don't say too much. Cause we'll have to give credit to that. <laughs> we could get accused of plagiarism. Cause that's exactly what that bulletproof screen. Oh, really? Podcast. Talk to oh, me. Okay. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Wow. It's actually pretty good. Um, hi bulletproof. If you want to come on our show, but <laughs> going great. Going back to Dragonet, then um, we do have this fish out of water type yep. thing, but we also yeah. have the thought, of, or not the thought, the the, the idea of um, is this a morality play? It seems like it because he he's very rigid, but then he starts kind of go towards street back uh, line of thinking where it's a little outside of the box. I can still be me, but I can also adopt new things and I can grow as a human being. I can make and of course street back goes the other way. To yeah. a certain extent, taking on like his weird moment of dressing down the other long haired cop yeah. Yeah. Uh, that he realizes he's becoming Friday, too. And again, that's that's part of any buddy comedy. There has to be where you have your two mismatched guys. You have to have a little bit of bleed. So it's between the two. It's a buddy. It's a fish out of water film. It's a buddy film. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a buddy cop film. Pseudo road particular. trip film because they drive a lot, I guess. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of car chases. Yeah. Wacky Which, car chases. Oh, the, but they do such a phenomenal job of setting that up too. Like that's why it's perfect. Like that first time where Friday's driving, and he's going super slow and they're making fun of him. Yeah. And then he's, and then Friday let's, street back pep drive and then he's going to write up some tight citations for him <laughs> and then completely flipping that back again where when uh dan Aykroyd friday is desperately worried about his loved one he becomes the even crazier driver like this movie just does a really good job of building jokes that first uh chase scene with the the uh, limousine mm -hmm. where they're at the marina mm -hmm. yeah there were parts of that big chunks of that they reminded me of batman v superman chase scene where, just where Batman, porn? like the no, the, the the where the Batmobile is chasing after the guy, and then the Batmobile takes the the car and throws it, and it's just a lot of it reminded me of like I'm watching Batman v Superman, only super super low budget yeah. and in the eighties. <laughs> right, right. But it's a it's a by it's a it's a uh, by the numbers cop chase scene for the time, and they're and they're to a certain extent making fun of that because like the, instead of the fruit cart that they blast through, it's the uh, the pile of stuffed animals. Yeah, look out, Muppets! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Tom Mankiewicz was born in L.A., died in L.A., but he has whole family. Man, uh, he was actually involved in Superman the movie oh, as well. Cool. Yep, and, and James Bond film. So, like, this dude knew what he was doing when he made this movie because he was born in, what, 42? This came out in, what, 87, we said? Yeah, so 87, yep. About my age when he made this. Wow. So far to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's important to have aspirations still. Yeah. Um, I only have one page of notes. And I, Alan, I did not. I came up with one quote, but I was so afraid to like even try to quote anything because all the best quotes are Dan Aykroyd delivering them in a way that I can't deliver them. Like his I delivery deliver. is so freaking one good. Of the, one of the best parts mm. of the movie that made me actually laugh out loud, laugh out loud. They're standing there in the zoo looking at the lion. And the lion's got a mohawk. And uh, Pep is joking around like, oh, you don't see that every day. And then... <laughs> Dan Eckroyd's character Friday goes, what are you going to tell all those students or those little kids that probably don't ever want to see a lion again because they were disappointed? He's like, it'll grow back. And they're like, yay! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like... uh, the only one of uh, Friday's lines I, I wrote down, because again, they're mostly really long yeah. lines because it has to be a good buildup for that kind of that kind of joke. Um, I, it's, the, it's half of one that I ended up writing down. But don't drag me down into your private hell. <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, tagline for the podcast. Hey, guys. Yeah. That's why I wrote that one down. Friendship starts with first names. Oh, yes. That's and what that's, I got. That's, that's the moment. That's what I got out of this. Yeah. Because you guys keep calling me Clink. You don't know my first name. What's my first name? You don't know. Adjunct. Pep. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, you got a pretty good shot of guessing Mike around this institution. <laughs> <laughs> We've got eight million of them listeners at home, I, uh, which is why we do, in fact, have our brisk last name relationships here. Yes, I uh, pulled out uh, the Joe Friday quote, uh, part of a quote again: "Hallucinogenic love drugs." <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Alan, entom- em- em- etymology, is that the word for what words come from? Etymology, is that the right word? I'm- yes. Entomology. What's the etymology of pagan? It's not actually people against goodness and normalcy, right? That's not it, where that it, came it, from. No, it is. It is. I looked at no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we use the word pagan, usually, like in its original meaning, we meant that uh, it was uh, it was non-Christian. It was a uh, mm-hmm. more neutral term. Uh, over time, it became uh, pejorative, uh, much like barbarian became more pejorative over time until we got Conan. Um, the pagan uh, became like you're a, a synonym for evil. Mm. Or uh, and, and again, here, of course, it then becomes a stand in for our satanic organization. Again, persons against goodness and normalcy, which... <sighs> I would have Love liked the to... goat leggings. <laughs> yeah. Just, well, uh, so, hold on. Hold on. So the there's a uh, bacon thing is just so hilarious. Every, everything in this movie, right, is connected because there's a theft at the beginning that is part of this grand thing. And it's a, a series of thefts that's leading up to this grand event that yep, I have. The magazines tur- are, are MacGuffin here. And, and this is uh, t- where we get to the point where um, Pep and Joe Friday are going undercover to infiltrate this event that I have affectionately called the, uh, pagan sausage party because i didn't realize it back when i watched this when i was younger there were no females at that yeah, party weird. um i also said i may have to clap this but it looked like a um a maga rally <laughs> yes it actually does you don't have to clap it looks like actually, their extras are just a bunch of yeah. bikers and what, random dudes what i put down was a uh, mega rally after dark <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm leaving that in because I don't know another another quote um, the uh, the tagline or the first line of the uh, pagan manifesto. We believe bad sex and good drugs are the cornerstones of great (laughs) democracy. (laughs) Amen. I think that was what the platform that Kennedy ran on. Wow. (laughs) Yikes. Too soon. (laughs) No, no. Uh, Okay. Dabney Dabney Coleman. I lo- and this movie is phenomenal. I love him in Cloak and Dagger and some other things that he'd been in, but like his, the, the the way he speaks in this, the way he plays this character, I just love it. Which one is that? Yeah. Dabney Coleman is the pornographer. Oh, yeah. that guy's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I misremembered a line. I used to think that the line was, you've got balls big as church bells, Reverend, but the line is actually, Reverend, you've got balls big as church bells. <laughs> yeah, you got to do the, the weird got, southern list. Reverend, yeah, you've got balls just, big as church bells. Uh, but I put the reverend at the end, but the yeah, reverend should be at the that's, beginning. That, mm-hmm. it, 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 he, the way he talked was similar to, um, I don't know if you ever guys, you guys ever watch um, Boon, uh, uh, The Boondocks? No. is a cartoon. I know it exists, but I never watched but it. But there's a, there's a character called a, a pimp named Slipback. <laughs> and oh, yeah. you can't yeah. call him Mr. Slipback. His whole name is a pimp named Slipback. And he talks like that with a list. What and, would your pimp name be if you were a pimp? I don't know. You could call Barris the good doctor. That would be a good one. Dr. Love, dude. Mm-hmm. You can't Dr. Love. Yes, yeah, see, I already it, have a pimp. It works yeah. for everything. There you go. Yeah. What was that movie? Uh, was it Black Scorpion that we reviewed in season, superhero season? Yes, had, that had the terrible pimps in the it. The terrible yes. pimp name, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I hated that episode. I love how this season is just giving us callbacks to all the things we watched before because we talked about these things when we were yeah. well, watching those things. The callbacks are fun. Yeah. We've, um, built up a, we've built up a repertoire. And a reputation. For love. All right. So speaking oh <laughs> of reputations, let's talk about some of the other people who were in this. So uh, Emil Muzz, mm-hmm. the wonderful, uh, for lack of a better word, he's the real main bad guy because Christopher Plummer, while he is the real big bad, he does not act yeah, he's not threatening uh, a right? lot in the movie. He is he is mostly just plotting behind the scenes and yeah, being menacing at the end. That's the main villain, though. The main villain, oh yeah, the one but, that, a, but Abel scenes. does everything. Yeah, and yeah. like his his awful grinning yeah. face, his maniacal glee at being evil, is like is that's what. 
that's what Pagan is, ultimately. Um, Abel Muzz is actually played by Jack O'Halloran, uh, who is uh, another uh, Superman connection, by the way. He was non. Yeah. Uh, oh, he okay. was the big, right. thuggy, yep. not talking guy <laughs> in, uh, uh, among the Kryptonians in Superman 2. And he was also a football player. Six, six. Is that why player. he was so yeah, big? A, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's a big dude. Yeah, so and he's, he's incredibly almost, menacing looking. Yeah. He's almost like the Clarence Boddicker of this film, correct? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. He he steals it in the same way that uh, that uh, Red Foreman. That Red, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, God, Kurt, I Kurt swore I'd never forget the man's name again because I, I always used to refer to uh, Kurtwood Smith. I always used to refer to him as Clarence Boddicker yeah. because that's just a perfect role for anybody and just uh, his role in Dead Poet Society so is so good, so good too he plays the dad in Dead Poet Society oh, so yeah. good it's and been such a long time since I've seen that movie I watched that movie once a year that's what inspires me to teach every, every get up and teach every day <laughs> not not, not Dangerous it's, Minds it inspires or, me to get up and teach lean on day. me or no it's Dead Poet Society I, I watch Community once every couple of years and that helps me does it <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You do have some Chang tendencies. Exactly. No, we decided awesome. the Barris so, was Chang. Then the only other, so I have two other things that I wrote down as notes and then we can just uh, freeform because it's all about me. I don't care about anybody else. My, my WTF moment, again, going back to the pagan ceremony where the virgin Connie Swales is going to be sacrificed, thrown into a pit with a snake. And as she's thrown into the pit of water with a snake, Splash, whatever, uh, Pep and Friday have a back and forth where uh, Friday articulates that he has been trained as a lifeguard, but then he jumps into the pool head first. That's not how lifeguards would jump in. <laughs> right. Would jump it's in more theatrical. First. But it, 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 it is more theatrical. That's, if this movie has one flaw, that is its flaw. Wow. Is that the WTF moment? That's my WTF moment. That was like, what? And the that's f- it? I'm like, exactly. Everything else is perfect. This is Everything gonna, else is perfect. He said it was perfect. City of crime, which Can is I, my WTF. I got to the end and like, oh my god, is that Tom Hanks rapping? That, I was ready for Dan Aykroyd, but Can I, <laughs> you guys know that rap? They played that music video on MTV. There was a music yeah, video. Yeah, there, there, there was a music video for that. that. On MTV. It wow. did not seem as bad at the time. Nope. I don't oh, know yeah. Wrong. I had the words memorized when I was a kid. <laughs> I did. That awesome. And, that and Paul Revere by Beastie Boys. I mean, that's where I got my street cred. Can I say something? No. I uh, would like to. No. Why? I feel like I'm sort of disappointed in this episode. Like, we're not done yet. Well, no. Like, we watched a good movie. You guys watched a good movie. You should watch the movies with us. I mm, would maybe have to not do that. Yeah, he'd have to hide. You should especially start next week. <laughs> yeah. It's a biblical allegory. Oh, you yeah. like the Let's Bible. See, <laughs> Shirley would have to hide in the closet. Uh, use a VPN so that his parents didn't know what he was looking at on his phone. <laughs> actually, it's uh, if you did watch it, it's probably actually pretty sacrilegious given yeah. that it's so terrible. Well, it's and, like, and, how dare you offer this up to our Well, Lord and Lord given Savior that Alan picked it. So, because it's the, we're talking about the Apple, right? No, we're talking oh, about Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. so yeah. given that Alan picked it, yes. Yeah. Well, sacri- yeah, yeah. sacrilege aside, people <laughs> listen to this podcast to listen to you guys talk about bad movies. No, here's where you're wrong. People don't listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, our our listenings are are up pretty. They're doing pretty good. Good. We're working on. We're it. just yeah, over it, here it, yelling in the wind. It'd be amazing if we actually had some new released episodes. Hey, I, that's not on me anymore, Pally. Yeah, I know. And so, there's there's enough of, in this to uh, yeah. Enough don't don't weird let stuff in listen. this to be fun. Don't let Shirley dissuade us from what we're doing. We're doing the Lord's work here. Oh, my. And we'll make up yes. for it next week. The I, apple has yes. no redeeming qualities. There, I saw a burning bush on the way in, and it said, as I was thinking about not doing it today and postponing it, the burning bush said to me, the world needs because you watched. Star crash? You got to go whoosh. Oh. I'm supposed to whoosh. <laughs> Oh, sh- oh. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. <laughs> so, on my way in today, I was really thinking about whether or not this podcast should continue. You know, I was searching my soul deep, trying to understand, like, you know, of all the things that we could do in the world, is this the thing that I should be doing to influence future generations to give them hope? No, in a time of hopelessness, is this a time that we should be, you know, reaching for the mountain even though the floor is crumbling beneath us? And I, 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 I came to the conclusion. I put myself at the mercy of the Lord. And I said, Lord, what should I do? 
and and the bush caught fire <laughs> flames came up <laughs> and in the rumble i heard no. a faint voice that said you should do this because you know because you watched Wish star crash okay clink it might have been christopher christopher Plummer and not god i don't know but we're just doing it anyway <laughs> okay clink clink there, and barris. make this better for you clink and barris the sad part is i think he actually believes that like i think there hey, should be an intervention hey. hallucinogenic love drugs what can i say <laughs> I'm sympathetic, Vanderpool. I'm so egotistical. I think everything I do has biblical level. <laughs> That's fair. So. Nice. I like it. I knew we got along for a reason, Alan. Oh, my. So, so speaking I, of Christopher Plummer. Yes. Since we're, we watched this in honor of him. I feel like he didn't have much to do in this. Like he did. He had a lot. But I, I wanted more of that. That uh, uh, the evil and good playing where. I wanted to see more of him being evil and more of him being super, super good in public to have that, that split a little bit more. Hmm. Well, I like the fact that he was smarmy in both roles, actually. Yeah. The fact that you could, and, and he's an obvious, like, of course he's evil kind of moment. I mean, you're not going to see, you're not going to see a good televangelist in an eighties movie, especially you're just not, I mean, the, 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 uh, the huge scan, uh, televangelist scandals were very, very fresh and lots of people were just, Oh, you gotta be kidding me again. That they, we knew that this, that this guy's going to be bad right from the beginning. There's a lot of evil televangelists in eighties movies in particular. And then you stop getting televangelists because well, again, the entire category kind of got, smeared i mean they're still out yeah, there you still had church services on on tv obviously but that label had to go was this, because of jim baker yeah so was this around the time and this probably was a little bit of a response to that jim baker oh yeah yeah, controversy yeah. this is stuff, jim right? baker the, I, he's he's a jim baker stand-in pretty much because Except he doesn't have uh he doesn't have uh uh tammy faye to humanize him if anyways <laughs> i'm not gonna touch yeah. that uh it you still have televangelists, oh. but you don't have the name because you have the the people with the God needs to pay for my million dollar jet and oh yeah yeah stuff. yeah it's just it's we sad. at this point I mean that obviously if this guy's in a movie he's gonna be bad there's no surprise here if he was just like a like a crusading local minister then maybe we wouldn't suspect him. But then again, it is the 80s. I, I do think if you had a religious figure in a movie, generally they were going to be kind of bad. So are we saying um, that the 80s were uh, people were jaded against yes. people who were yeah, trying to do good? Yeah, uh, I, I'd say the outward trappings of uh, Christianity in a movie generally did not get associated with good. Things. Well, I, I don't mean so, I don't mean Christianity. I just mean people trying to do good in general. You had the eighties. There's as, that too. You had that. You had some segment of eighties cinema that was a response to some of the debauchery of the sixties and seventies. So a lot of 80, a fair amount of eighties cinema was hearkening back to romanticizing the fifties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I think this movie then um, decided mm -hmm. to give that an fu a little bit. Yeah, yeah, there is something of that. Yeah, I did make a mistake though. Uh, Tom Mankiewicz, the director of this, uh, it wasn't his father that worked on Citizen Kane. It was like an uncle or something else like that. Okay. So. Oh, okay. Well, still. Well, I want to make sure that we maintain our integrity as we. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, this. while we're speaking of integrity, let me share my favorite line from Ooh. this movie, which I can still do from memory. Uh, but I'm going to read it just so I don't screw it up under pressure. Is it? And let me see if I can steal. It. I'm going to guess it, Alan. This is some good coffee. <laughs> is that the line? Okay. Is that no. why you watched the the, the the the? Yes, that is that scene is exactly why I watched this movie. So you didn't watch the movie; you just watched like a, a two minute segment. No, I had to have a refreshing period. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> it is uh, well, Emil. I guess it's just you and me, <laughs> your balls, and this drawer. Yes. What in the world? 
Oh, uh, good cop, bad cop. Uh, Interrogation it is tactics. A, uh, see, it is actually a uh, police torture scene that is, in light of more modern events, uh, a sign of how callous and terrible we were in the 80s that we thought this was hilarious, and how cal- callous and terrible I am that I still think that scene is just <laughs> yeah. goddamn hilarious. But. Super, super illegal. Sit on it and spin, yeah. copper. Yeah. Whatever he says. <laughs> but this, he's got stubby hands for like a big guy, too. That was weird. Yeah. But it's super Are you illegal, going to blur that? even at the time. No. Oh yeah, it's it's incredibly illegal and immoral. It's as yeah. a torture scene. It is actually <gasps> worse than Dirty Harry. I think uh, uh, Christopher Nolan probably got all his ideas for Batman from this movie because it reminds <laughs> me of the Dark Knight Joker Batman. You scene. shouldn't <laughs> always go for the head first because then it dulls the pain for yeah. everything else, and then he hit, and then he hits the hand, yeah. and he goes, "See, <laughs> yeah, kick him in the ding ding." <laughs> Uh, um, this is now I have a, a real question. What do you think this movie would have been like if Bill Murray would have played the role of Pep? Why is that a question? Very different. Well, because it's know if he he's a big star in the eighties. Well, yes, I understand that, but but uh, you know, from their relationship, um, Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd with Ghostbusters and everything else, it would just seem mm-hmm. like maybe that would have been the logical choice. Yeah. It, it, oh, yeah. it would have been a very different relationship. It wouldn't have been the same because Tom Hanks in the 80s when he was doing comedy was very much about kind of going to a t- uh, a 10 and a half, almost 11 at some port- parts to kind of beef up the comedy. Whereas Bill Murray is the sarcastic, jaded, lazy, lovable guy that we you know we, we've known from the ghostbusters and stripes and uh, groundhog day and all that stuff so and, it, and bill murray is cynical yeah i mean his his projection is cynical uh right. whereas tom hanks can do cynical to a minor extent here but really he's just he just wants to do his own thing here we discover that he is not actually jaded or anything he's He's every bit as much of an idealist in his way as as uh, Friday is. Yeah. It's just he is different. Uh, so I, I think Murray would have made it more deflation. Uh, it, you, it would have been a greater deflation of Friday. And the, the it would, have, it would have been too much. The scenes with Tom Hanks, uh, Pep uh, calling uh, the woman's mother, the love interest yeah. mother. And just kind of checking in to see if she came mm-hmm. in, and because he hadn't heard from Friday, and then the scene with uh, Pep and uh, Friday's grandmother, yeah, would have been completely different with Bill Murray. Yeah, because Bill Murray, I don't think would have been authentic there. Yeah, he, and, he and, could be though, because there's little bits of that in Groundhog Day, and also in when he's hitting on um, Sigourney Weaver's character in Ghostbusters. Diane, no. Anyways, see, there are times when he's actually being a little charming. Right. So that could happen, but it would be a completely different yeah. feeling movie. It, I'm not is, accusing the man of being soulless. I'm just no. saying he projects <laughs> more of a cynical. I, I love Bill His Murray. humor is more cynical. And that, that, that's what I thought. Like, I'm, you know, I was just watching it again last time. Like, why wasn't Bill Murray in this? But anyway, um, Tom Hanks is interesting. I'm looking up his filmography right now. Uh, Mazes and Monsters does not show up in his filmography. So he must be editing his own wow. <laughs> Wikipedia page. All right, allow me to move away from the microphone Uh-oh. because somebody mentioned mazes and monsters. I am part of the holy man. Anyway, <laughs> yes, that's the reason I, I don't play you. Dungeons and Dragons. That after we're going to watch mazes me. and monsters at some point, but it's boring. Oh, oh it's my horrible. god, it, 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 it's work. Tom, I mean, it's not good. Yeah, Tom Hanks is the best thing in it, and he's terrible. Oh yeah, yeah. It's only to, sh- to see him uh, debase himself with the expectation that he will get much better even in bosom buddies so this this really though this movie if we look at it um well i don't know because this was in 97 87 87. sorry and his filmography starts in like the 80s with he knows you're alone i don't know what that is um but then splash that's a good movie bachelor party man with Mm -hmm. one red shoe volunteers money pit and uh, then two other things I've never seen, and then this, and then after this, right? That's when I mean, big. I think yeah, when big came out. That was the big explosion moment. for him. But um, yeah, I think Tom Hanks was perfectly. That's again perfectly cast. The person who plays uh, Connie Swales, perfect. Like her face and everything, how she emotes was all just perfect. The grandmother, 
Uh, everybody's perfect in this. A uh, fun detail about uh, Connie Swale, too. At the dinner at the Brown Derby, uh, when everybody else at the table is drinking champagne, she has a Shirley Temple. I yeah. just noticed that this time around. That was cool. Like, okay, that's cute. <laughs> yeah. You know, speaking of, like, switching roles... I've always wanted to see like modern day Tom Hanks, you know, the lovable guy that everybody is like an American treasure. I always wanted to see him as like a serial killer or some sort of villain. Uh, Road to Perdition. Uh, he's you, you he's spend, a father that's trying to actually uh, uh, give food and, and money to his okay. family and everything. Clink. So he's got redeemable features, but like a full blown serial killer, Silence of Lamb style, where he's super, mm. super charming. Clink. And then halfway through the movie, you figure out he's the killer. Well, if they wouldn't have wasted their Hanks quota in Dexter with Colin Hanks, they could have used oh, yeah. Tom Hanks instead of the for John Lithgow's role. That could have been interesting. That's, but that, John Lithgow that killed that role, pun intended. Yeah, 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 did you, you want to say something, producer? Clink, you've spent too much time with Barris and Vanderpool. You need to flee while <laughs> no, you're still young and innocent. I've, I've always no, said no, this. this is a this is a legitimate question because tom hanks has so fallen into uh slash america america's dad slash um uh like lovable patriarch moment at this point and i given his earlier career it could have gone in a very different direction i think well bosom buddies I loved that, that show that was a good I show yeah. my favorite shows again, of all time another demonstration of why i am probably a terrible person i still think those are buddy it's just really funny yeah, that's good. Yeah. I, and in fact i was just talking with vanderpool today and it's weird how much i know it's been 40 years but it's weird how much tom hanks has changed like uh uh oh, role yeah. wise like you started out with i mean big is, is somewhat dramatic but it's, mm. it's still kind of comedic and then you go from mm. that to uh slippers in seattle or those other types of movies where they're more kind of uh, serious r- romance uh, movies then you look at somebody like um, Bruce Willis and they start out as a comedic actor and because they were kind of a comedic whatever underdog actor, that's why they were so good for Die Hard and then after Die Hard it was just, hey, you're going to shoot things and explosions are going to happen. You're always going to have a hangover and then a five o'clock shadow because that's what you do and that's who you are. And I'm going to argue that comedy is the hardest of the genres. I, I think that's been proven. A really too. good movie of definitely because yeah. you had like um, uh, uh, Jim Carrey, uh, uh, Rob Williams. I can't think of anybody else, but went from super super crazy zach, zany com, uh, comedic roles to super super serious dramatic roles and doing phenomenal with them. And I don't necessarily see a dramatic actor being able to do a good job, like a, a great job, as much as they did, as much as the comedic actors did with a comedic role. So yeah, I agree with that. It's, it's, I'm trying to think of any exceptions to that. It's well, real- uh, uh, Leslie Nielsen. He yeah, started out as but dr- Leslie dramatic. Nielsen was a crap actor prior to becoming funny. But so. he he started out as a dramatic actor though, so it right. was always dr- was, drama, drama, drama. But he was able to that that actually became part of his humor because he was so stilted and weird that it just became hilarious yeah there. so so a comedic a good comedic actor as long as they can break find the right script i think which is what happens with like jim carrey mm-hmm. like truman show was his transition script i really i think ah he had a dramatic role prior to that was it 23 which, nope it Twice was bitten? in it was in the last <laughs> dirty harry movie the really? Deadpool, where he plays rock star Johnny Squares, and he lip syncs to "Welcome to the Jungle." I didn't know. I, that. Yeah, put the because you watch Star Crash next time, next season, three seasons from now when we do the recap of all the things. Yeah, how many seasons of this do you want to do? Sixty-nine, of course. All of the seasons. How many episodes, Vanderpool? Sixty-nine. All of the episodes. <laughs> do you hear someone talking? I just hear a I, wild adjunct. I heard nothing. <laughs> Gonna throw something at you. I mean, so um, here we go. <laughs> We're up nine. against it. We're up against it. Um, you know, I think again. Did you guys have any WTF moments? Or I mean, I didn't hear anything. I, I have my favorite scene in the movie. What's that? Which is not the torture scene. It is actually the uh, scene in which they are. It's right after uh, the. Uh, the, their infiltration of the pagan ritual and they're back at uh captain gannon's office 
Mm -hmm. and they are demonstrating the goat dance. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And it switches to that external shot of Gannon's office, and Harry Morgan just drops his (laughs) (laughs) as they're doing the crazy goat dance. It's, yeah, I. I laugh out loud every time I see it. It's just perfect. And he's perfect. And I, in and that I love Harry Morgan. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 he's always been, it's, it, it was a toss up between him and the, and father Mulcahy as my favorite characters on mash. And, uh, I had a couple. What's that? WTF moments. Yes. What's that? So at the very, very, very beginning, the quote unquote fire department is there and they're taking all those, uh, magazines and then the security guard's like, nobody called the fire department. And then, you know, he sets fire. And, but he goes, give your give someone, whoever, a message for me. And then he knocks him out. And then he says he's going to go out of business. Like, you can't, yeah. you can't give a message mm-hmm. if you don't know what the message is. I think that was an indication Emil Muzz is a profoundly stupid yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> In addition to being really, really menacing. And then they come back from the, that same scene you were just talking about. They come back from the pagan uh, dance. It's four in the morning. They're done explaining everything that happened. Uh, uh, Pep uh, takes out uh, uh, his uh, uh, little notepad, and all these drugs start flying all over the place. And then the captain thinks that they were just drugged up and having a good time, and then they imagined all of this? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Given Friday's... Uh, uh, history and given Pep's supposed history that we we kind of know about him. That that again for me was a weak a weak spot too. Yeah, and then finally, why does the LAPD need a fighter jet? Why wouldn't they? It doesn't make any sense. But it's California. California love. <laughs> yeah. D's. Do you know D's? Oh, jeez. I do not. <laughs> what have we learned today, gentlemen? <laughs> what did we learn today? That's a great thing. I don't know. Did I learn anything? Oh, gosh. I learned. I learned that my thirteen-year-old self had really, really good taste in movies. I, I don't think you watched it for that, though. I did. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is audio. Giving you an incredulous look. Blink. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for some I know, but I'm trying to for the audio. For the audio. For the audio. In no. this scene, Mike Clink gives Mike Vanderpool an incredulous look. I mean, yeah, there's obviously some some stuff in this movie that um, a 13 year old a heterosexual male would appreciate, but I mean, it's 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 really slim pickings, right? It's not the whole thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I just like the goofballiness of Tom Hanks, mm-hmm. and I love the straight delivery of of Dan Aykroyd. I mean, those guys. You know, from uh, uh, I wasn't watching SNL then, but like Ghostbusters, I think Ghostbusters was a film that anybody that was in that I would watch anything other than alien that they were in. Cause I didn't like scary things when I was younger. Cause I was by myself all the time. Alien. Who was an alien? Sigourney Weaver. Oh, duh. Ghostbusters. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, okay. I, I jumped like eight <laughs> things to get to that. So what did you learn? Mr. Clink? Alan, what did you learn? <laughs> I learned avocado is not a fruit. I learned that the LAPD actually does have an air support division. Yeah, that was really weird for me. I didn't understand. They don't, dun, dun, dun. I don't think they have a fighter jet, unfortunately. Well, fortunately in the modern period. But for the purposes of the verisimilitude of this movie, um, they do not have a fighter jet, but they do have multiple helicopters, obviously. So um, I guess, yeah, they wouldn't really need a fighter jet but anyway it was a cool scene so there you go <laughs> being a young 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 child in the 80s like i was born in 84 um i Gosh, didn't you're know older. anyways i didn't know that the this uh the watch jacket. tv thing was a thing mm, i thought right. that was later on i mean that could very well just be for the movie but it seemed like it was not just for the movie that piece of technology actually existed that's amazing to me i looked it up yeah wow. Uh, the the Seiko uh, TV watch uh, was in existence at that point. It cost about five hundred bucks. But and this is again why I will say this was a pretty perfect movie. Is that like so from the use of the watch? Uh, remember when Aykroyd is talking to Connie Swale the first time, and she's looking through the mugshot book, and then he puts down the magazine, and it's actually hint, yep, in, yep. like they just do a really good job of of that whole um, even though they do take some time to deliver jokes and punchlines and stuff like that of continuously reminding you of the threat 
What could have been cool? Really good. I think the story's fun. I think the script is phenomenal here. What, what could have also been cool is when she demasked uh, Christopher Plummer's character at the, at the begin ceremony. Yeah. If we didn't see his face, if we saw the behind his head, and she would looked in shock, Ooh. and then the entire time it's just there are hints, but we don't know. And then she uh, at the restaurant is the one that kind of goes, "Oh, that's him." And then we could be with you know, other people going, "Are you sure?" Because that dude's supposed to be nice and good and. Yeah, that would have been interesting. I don't know. I kind of liked the fact that they didn't rely on that. Because, <laughs> yeah. again, it's an 80s movie. He's a televangelist. He's terrible. <laughs> yeah, they, He's they were... obviously going to be a horrible well, It'd be being. the same thing with in Blank Man when we watched that. Uh, uh, I think, Vanderpool, you thought that the mayor was going to be bad. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I so was totally set up that. for yeah. the mayor to betray everybody. So, so did everybody learn something? I think so. Shirley, what did you learn? <laughs> I learned that Shirley's pretty freaking bored over there. You should watch these movies. He should totally watch The Apple. Okay, the it'll, list it'll of reasons so I terrible. do not watch the movies were enumerated at about the 12-minute mark of the episode. So if you're Was confused, that before or after we started over because you forgot to tell me to hit record? We're not starting over. You can just use the wide-angle camera. You'll be no, fine. No, I'm going to put up a title, insert footage here. <laughs> for crying That's out loud. Funny. Actually, I'm going to put a, a footage of turtles having sex because that's probably the equivalent of what we need. We're not an industrial off. band. <laughs> we are a movie podcast. Uh, so, so a movie of turtles having sex. Oh, my goodness. Okay. 24 frames per second. <laughs> All right. Uh, until next time where we talk about, uh, we'll pick up our regular scheduled programming. We should have done the ding, 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 ding special thing. Did you guys see what I posted in Slack? The Christmas Dragnet episode. Oh. Yeah, I didn't watch that though. I started to. I'm saving. Oh it. yeah, yeah. Next yeah. Christmas, we're gonna do some TV shows. Christmas right. 2021. All right, yep. I'm good so, with that. Until then, uh, well, not until Christmas. Until next time, where we're gonna do the Apple. Uh, what Doctor year Apple. did that come out? The Apple is 1980, I believe. Okay. Uh, it's really close to that. If it's not, and it's a musical, right? Oh yeah, it's it's. I, Bad. Shirley, you got to watch this. I it love is a 1980 bad. film, and I will not be watching. It. I love musicals. They're my favorite. It is favorite. a Golan awesome. and Globus attempt at a musical. Seriously, a rock opera. Oh, yes, I'm so is excited. So is, is this a rock opera like uh, Flash Gordon was a rock opera type thing? No, because Flash Gordon's Wait. music was good for the most. <laughs> oh, sweet. Um, this is like if you took Rent and hit it in the head with a pipe a few times and then dressed it and then projected it back to 1980. <laughs> and it's just, oh, it's, it's bad. So I'm going to, you use... will beg for newsies after this. <laughs> you like will, newsies. You oh. will beg for Xanadu. Okay. No. <gasps> Xanadu. Okay, before we talk about any other Xanadu movies. Xanadu is a masterpiece and compared to the I, I totally, totally will be taking hallucinogenic love drugs when I watch the album. Okay. <laughs> it is necessary. You will need as many as they needed to knock out that snake, and, too. Yeah, enough to kill a snake. All right, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, me, Mike Vanderpool, Michael Klink, Dr. Alan Barris, John Shirley, our producer, because you watched Wish. <laughs> you don't wish it as good as you used to. Our relationship's getting stale. <laughs> I, ha I have to vary it up. So there's there's that whoosh like we had before. And then whoosh because we're done. Okay. Bye, fo bye folks. <laughs> whoosh. Bye. Bye. <laughs>